Welcome to the Three Haunted Podcast, where we bring you all things horror, supernatural, folklore, mythology, and all things that go bump in the night. What's up, everybody? This is your co-host, Ashley Lunar Goddess, guerrilla girl filmmaker and horror-loving cinephile. I'm just your average podcast-producing badass. I'm John Thomas. Some would say that I go a little too far with my love of all things horror, paranormal, and meta, but I say... Talk nerdy to me, and I'm all yours. What's up, goals, gals, and all of our meta pals? In today's episode, we'll be talking with author and medical intuitive Dr. Rita Louise. Rita is founder of the Institute of Applied Energetics, as well as a naturopathic physician. Welcome to the show, Dr. Rita Louise. Thanks for having me, guys. So fun to finally get here. Yay! (laughs) The universe aligned. We are finally together. (laughs) So I'm really excited to have you on, and I would love to just out the gate start with, what is a medical intuitive? Sure. So, and I like to put things in very understandable and simplistic terms. So a medical intuitive is a person that has psychic abilities and they talk to somebody about their health related concerns, you know, so a person that's a medium, you know, this is for your people, you know, they talk to dead people. That's kind of their thing where a medical intuitive is, you know, they talk about health related stuff, you know, whether it's physical health, emotional health, mental health, but help. Which is great because I feel like on a lot of the social media platforms, you have people that are intuitive, but they have a very strong boundary oftentimes if we don't discuss health. So to have someone that specializes in that is phenomenal. Well, it, you know, you can get into liability <laughs> issues. I've never had that issue personally. Uh, you know, and it's interesting because I won't talk about dead people. I mean, unless it's like a ghost at your house or I'm doing a, you know, an investigation, I'll talk about your ghost that stay at your house. (laughs) But, you know, I do a live stream myself on Thursdays and they were like, tell me about my dead mother. It's like, sorry, don't talk to dead people unless I'm at your house and I'm talking to your dead people at your house. I mean, that's quite a conversation starter if, you know, (laughs) I don't talk to dead people unless they're in your home, in which case. (laughs) You know, from a, I'm going to say intuitive perspective, in order to talk to your mom or whoever, I have to invite them to come like sit next to me, which means they're now in my house and I don't want them in my house, you know, so I'll go to your house and interact, but I know because they might not go and I don't want them. (laughs) Yeah. They may decide to stay there. They are not welcome. (laughs) (laughs) So how long have you been on this journey of being an intuitive or is this just a lifelong thing? It has really been a lifelong thing. I started my own practice in my early thirties. Um, I actually did not believe that I had psychic abilities, even though it was something that I really wanted and read all of these books with the hope that something would happen and um, found the Berkeley Psychic Institute and studied with them and came to the realization very early on that I had been really psychic my whole life and never connected the, the dots between, you know, when you pick up a gift and, you know, at Christmas and you kind of give it a little shake and it's like, well, it's either a crystal or a pewter figure and you open it up and one box is a crystal and the other box is a pewter figure. It's like, oh, that's kind of, it's, it's not just a weird coincidence. It really is a, a psychic thing. Yeah. That's pretty specific. <laughs> It's not a guess like, oh, it's a toy. Like that is very specific. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) How long have you been interested in these topics? Because I know you said this is something you always wanted, but you just didn't believe you possess. I believe I saw on your website, there was something around the age of eight. Was it prior to that, that you were really interested in this world? 
So when I was eight, I really got interested in the whole theory of evolution. And so archaeology and anthropology were my first love in life. And um, But when I was 13, there were two TV series. One was The Amazing Kreskin, who was a mentalist and had ESP. And a different series called The Sixth Sense, who featured Gary Collins, who is a parapsychology professor who had ESP. And so between those two shows, I was like, wow, this is really cool. And so I moved from the archaeology and anthropology stacks at the library to the psychic ability stacks, which was about eight books right next to the witchcraft books, which I didn't touch because <laughs> I went to Catholic school and I knew that that would be bad. <laughs> so the, the medium stuff, was that the first thing that you really gravitated towards or did you have any paranormal experiences that were kind of triggering something that you didn't necessarily, was it, was it all just the medium stuff or was it more paranormal things or. So this is going to sound stupid, but, uh, <laughs> and even to this day, um, you know, I tell people that I'm scared to go. So even though I do investigations and I'll like go, oh, well, there's, a, you know, a dead invisible guy over there and blah, 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 whatever. Um, I will not go into old scary houses or uh, buildings by myself. Like, isn't happening. You know, I did an investigation at the Baker Hotel and there was no power, no nothing. And everybody went this way down the hall and we were with a film crew and I'm like, but I want to go into that room over there. And they're like, we'll just go. And I'm like, uh, uh-uh. I'm not going in there by myself. <laughs> That's not stupid. You and I are birds of a feather. Like I've been experiencing paranormal my entire life. And, you know, I do tend to feel, and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Individual energies, but for me, I'm the, I'm the same. You and I are the same. I'm not going to go by myself into something that feels haunted or people is say people say is haunted. They want to go on these paranormal investigations, and I'm like, how many people can we get? Can we get a group of thirty? Because I'm right. I'm like you. I'm scared. <laughs> She's like the more the merrier. I mean, I've gone to places, you know, and there is the traditional turn, you know, have the lights off, and I'm like click and I turn the light on and they're like well, what are you doing that for I'm like I can see the ghost with the light on and I'm I'm okay having the light on I don't need to be in some dark room with a ghost you know and it's and and when I interact with the ghost they don't even scare me so it's not the ghost it's the the mindset or the the bumps in the night and the weird stuff that kind of tied to that whole thing that maybe the sur- like the surprise, me <laughs> the surprise uh-huh. things that you're like, you're like, I know you're in here. Just don't like make loud noises. Just, you know, don't, don't scare me. Like I just relax. Like you're chill. I'm chill. Like, let's just enjoy the space together and then everything will be all right. So th- I live in far East Texas. And so there was a bed and breakfast called the pride house, which was known to be very haunted. And I was there, were we doing an investigation there? I don't know, but we were staying there. And of course they're like, oh, we're going to put you in the really haunted room. And I'm like, great. (laughs) And so I'm there and I'm with my husband and we're like laying on the bed because it was like in between what we were working on and dinner time. And so we're just like chilling, laying on the bed. And I hear this like, noise and he started laughing he goes you jumped so high (laughs) and it turned out to be the it was one of those pull down shades you know the old fashioned Mm -hmm. kind that rolled up into the thing it scared the crap out of me I have always wondered why a lot of these, and it has to be for entertainment value, but why a lot of these in these ghost hunting shows that they keep the lights off. I understand the buildings that they just don't have electricity, but the ones where they turn the lights off and they're investigating, I'm like, you know, the darkness could be disarming. It really can. Like we feel more vulnerable just from a senses perspective, right? We have a lot 
more limited senses when it comes to being in the dark, or most of us do. Like my night vision's awful. So I absolutely do not like being in the dark if I don't have to be other than sleeping. But I do, I do oftentimes wonder, is it just to get people feeling spooky and excited when they're on investigations to turn the lights off? Because I don't think the ghosts know the difference. Like, oh, <laughs> lights are off, guys. Come on out. Let's do this. Right. Honestly, I think it's just for ambiance, basically. I mean, you can investigate during the day. You don't need to have the lights off. You can see these things during the day, whether they want to move an object or whatever. They can obviously do it during the day. They can move it whenever they want. So I think it's just kind of... Like you said, more for the feel and everything else. That's just my opinion on that. And they're expensive night vision cameras. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, you got to use those things. So yeah, you're going to make them pay for themselves after a while. <laughs> and they do look creepy. Like if, if you stare, right, the eyes are super bright and everything. It's it's kind of a crazy uh, look. But yeah. Um. So I guess my other question would be, you don't, you have talked to ghosts before is there a reason why you didn't go that route and you went the route that you are currently on the path that you're on right now or do you do both <laughs> she laughs like, <laughs> they might have to talk to ghosts and they might not be at my house uh, <laughs> right but let's revisit <laughs> So I grew up in a house that had a residual haunting in the basement. It was the dead guy. So everybody in my family knew about the dead guy. And then when I went to college, I moved into a house that I discovered after moving in and, of course, signing a lease, that it had been the town funeral parlor. And I would spend many a day there. The, and it was, it was actually very actively haunted. Um, and so between those two experiences, you know, I already like, didn't like the dead guy that lived in the basement, you know, <laughs> that it was just like, I don't need to do that. Um, you know, and, and I'm actually going to kind of caveat into something a little bit different. I'm not real auditory, you know, I'm more of a empath clairvoyant. So I see images, I get feelings. And so for them to say, oh, well, I died because of blah, blah, blah. You know, I don't get that kind of information, you know. And people that have intuitive gifts, you know, they have their channel, you know. So people that are really good mediums, it's kind of like they can just tap into that information, bam, 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 bam. What I found when I graduated from the Berkeley Psychic Institute was that when I was working with people, I was always finding their health issues, which led me to go back to school, get a degree as a naturopath, and then my PhD in natural health counseling. And so apparently, you know, the work propelled me forward in that. And it was back a million years ago before people did ghost hunting, you know, before that was a thing. I mean, I was already, you know, well ensconced in my practice when I was contacted by a ghost hunting group to come join their team and be the group psychic, you know, and that was like before ghost hunters, before all of the shows. So when you say that you were working with people and the health stuff was coming up, how was that manifesting to you? Was it more so just an intuitive knowing or were you seeing um, images of the health issues? Like how did, how did that look? Okay. So, you know, in addition to doing the psychic stuff, I do energy work and this is where it would show up more often. And so I would be clearing their body and I would get to a certain body part and, and notice that there was an anomaly wow. and kind of investigate that, you know? And so, you know, I'd be working with someone and I would just see this like line down their abdomen, like lower abdomen, it would be a woman. And I would just go, hysterectomy or cesarean, because that's the only thing that's going to leave you with a scar there, you know, but it just showed up in their body, you know, and I'm real visual, real visual, you know, so I would, I would see these things and then make commentary about it. Were they receptive to something like that? Was, did it freak people out ever with your, well, when you were first discovering it or was it more like, oh, wow, that's great. <laughs> like, what, what was the sense from the people that you have, that you used these gifts with? So I'm not one of those kind of people that 
you know, the waitress comes by and you're sitting at the table eating dinner and go, hey, have you had a hysterectomy? You know, I'm not one of those kind of people. I mean, people, people all have. The time. <laughs> but go ahead, sorry. <laughs> I have friends that they will like give messages or provide information, and I just am not intrusive that way. You know, but if somebody comes and sits in the chair in front of me, you know, because they want to know what I know, or you know, then then there to me, there's no hold bar because you sat in the chair and you invited me in made a schedule and an appointment for something. It wasn't, it wasn't random occurrences. So that's correct. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I'm glad you aren't the other way. Cause I've definitely met way too many of those types of people. And it's and me and my mother, both people always come up to us and just, just start talking to us randomly. So it's about weird things. So it's, it's fun. Well, people talk to me about weird things all the time and I'm cool with that, but <laughs> Okay, it's telling me to be a little politically incorrect here. Go for it. But I find that people that do that tend to be a little bit ego driven, you know, where they need, where they have this need to come and perform. And I'm not, you know, this is, this is what I do. And then they're like, oh, well, you must be a witch. It's like, no, this is what I do. And this is a gift given to me from God. And I don't need to sit there and run around telling people how great I am. <laughs> well, there's an element of consent to permission to interact with somebody's energy, to imprint on their energy. And so I am with you. If someone sits in your chair across from you and is like, help my energy while well, now you are reading it and whatever surfaces, that's what's coming up. And for you, it was the medical stuff, it sounds like. So I will talk to you about anything but dead people. And I don't predict the future. Those are my only two rules. I mean, I have, I talk to people about, you know, alien implants and my, my practice is the land of the weird people come to me with some of the weirdest stuff that, um, you know, but promotion wise and from a marketing perspective, you know, I pitch myself as a medical intuitive versus Okay, so it's Dr. Rita, the medical intuitive versus Rita, the psychic chick. It's also more specific because otherwise you are going to get the read the future and talk to my ghosts versus very right. specifically, this is what I'm willing to work with. Now, have you ever mm -hmm. found an alien in plants? <laughs> yes, I was, I was going to ask that. I have. You have? <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. What did that look like? Like when you were... Uh, interacting and you came across that in the energy, how does that translate in the energetic field? So, the, you know, it's okay. So, so they were not physical implants okay. that I found. They were more energetic implants and to kind of give it a, a visual, it was almost like there was a crystal, although it seemed more plasticky and smoother that would be under the skin you know, perhaps in the muscle tissue. Oh, that's not crazy. a whole lot of it. But they're there. I'm telling you land of the weird. I love it. No, Absolutely. I think it's great. I have, I have another question. <laughs> uh, okay. with the alien implants. <laughs> so when you come across these things, is it because the person that's talking to you has an issue with it? Like it's bothering them in some way? Or is it something that they just feel in their body that's foreign but isn't really affecting them? Or are they actually, you know, coming to you? I've I've been abducted. I know I have. I'm I'm, but I need to check if something else is inside me because it maybe right. Okay, interesting question. I've never had anybody come to me that said that they've been abducted. So x that off. Um, I've had a couple of people who thought that there was stuff going on, but then I have to kind of put my little BS meter on and go, okay, so you're saying that, but is that really true? You know, usually I find weird stuff because they have this issue over here and I'm working with them going, oh, you got this thing going on. True story. I had a guy, and this was a long time ago, that came complaining about digestive issues and how he was losing weight. 
<clears throat> and so, you know, I start looking at his energy and he had this like wormy looking with a big head and big eyes and big teeth that sat in the middle of his stomach area. And, and it was a guy and guys tend to not be super open to stuff. You know, some are totally, and then there's a whole other group health wise that just want you to give them a supplement, you know? And it's like, well, I kind of don't work that way, but okay. And I'm going, okay, what am I supposed to do with this piece of information? Because it was the crux of what was going on. And I said, well, I just get the impression that it's not a digestive issue, but more of you don't really have a desire to eat food, you know, and, or you have this desire, but then when you go to eat the food, it's like you get turned off and then you choose not to. And he said, exactly. So then I have to caveat into, so if I talk about spiritual topics and if I say words like orange chakra, are you, are you on board with me? And he was like, oh, I used to study Edgar Casey and this and this and this. And I'm like, thank God. <laughs> I go, because you have this giant, like, wormy thing that's sitting in your stomach. And it's the wormy thing that's controlling your energy, making it so that you don't want to eat. You know, and this was a long time ago before I really did any, like, entity removal stuff. But, I mean, to me, if I was going to classify it, I would say that this was a full-blown possession because entities don't necessarily enter the physical body. They'll be in the auric field, but not the physical body. And this was in his body. So how did you two deal with that? I didn't. I referred him. Got it. You know, like you need to go find, I mean, I didn't even have any supplements for him. I mean, this was that long ago, you know, before I went back to school and stuff. Here's a holy um, water capsule. Take two a day. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> oh, no, this is all by phone. I mean, most oh. of my clients are, you know, remote. Wow. And even back then, like, to be remote, that's pretty progressive because that's, for the most part, especially with the metaphysical world, a lot of the remote treatments – is I feel is like a lot newer. So the fact that you were doing that back then, that's pretty awesome. So I live in Texas and <laughs> Texas, you know, especially it's changed, um, was not particularly open to anything. And so when I moved here, I realized that I needed to really focus on having a national platform, you know, so I had my first web page up in the mid nineties, oh, wow. you know, on my own domain name, soulhealer.com. And I found out I, I got it in 1996, you know, and someone said, well, how did you end up with a one word domain name? I go, it's because it's that old. <laughs> That's awesome. So the things that you, um, I'm curious about back to the, uh, if you don't mind talking about your schooling, um, I went to film school and, you know, at film school, I went to try to study all these different things because I was interested in all of the different things. And there's so many jobs that go into making a film. I think about the what you must have gone through in discovering your talents and your gifts. And did they go have you go through all these different tests and things to to kind of bring out your gifts and um, were like how did that develop? Was that just, just sitting with people, sitting different groups of people, channeling different ways, that kind of thing? So it was practice, 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 practice. We had a class once a week where we got brain food and they were always pretty lame. And the rest of the time, you know, you were required to do minimally two client sessions a week. And so when you did the session, normally there would be a group of three plus psychics in the room, minimally two, that would work with a specific client. And then once a month, there was a psychic fair. And so you were doing like your basic like 15 minute readings and, um, and you were required to work six hours at the psychic fair, both Saturday and Sunday. And so it was just put your time in and practice and practice and practice and practice and practice because doing psychic work is about honing the muscle 
and about getting validation because sometimes you tell people some of the weirdest, weirdest things that don't even make sense to you, but is there life experience? You know, and one of the other things that Berkeley really in, emphasized <clears throat> was the ability, you know, they would say, we train you so that you can read, do a reading in Grand Central Station and not be bothered. And so you would be at these fairs and they would have booths. So there was like the relationship booth. So if you wanted to do relationship readings, you'd go to the relationship booth. Or if you want to do like financial readings, you'd go to the finance booth. And they had different categories. And in these booths, they would have folding chairs. And the folding chairs would be side by side, just boom, 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 boom. And then a row of your client facing you, boom, 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 boom. So it was like, so there could literally be two different readings going on, one on either side of you. And you got to the point where you could just sit there and focus on your client and not be interfered by the person who was literally inches away, unless they said something really juicy. And then everybody would turn and look and be like, oh, sorry, sorry. You know, cancel, cancel. Wait, let me get back. <laughs> like speed dating almost in that, that kind of way. If you hear something mm -hmm. you're talking about, you're like, ooh, let's, let's, let me focus on this for a minute. <laughs> well, head would turn and no comments would be made. And we'd be like, sorry, but that was pretty juicy. <laughs> <laughs> like, we're going to talk about that later. Uh <laughs> when, when? <laughs> and not only have you, you know, interacted and cared for people one-on-one, -on -one, but you also have released books for people to kind of assist themselves in the process. Uh, mm -hmm. The one that stood out for me is the avoiding the cosmic two by four. Uh, I, I haven't had a chance to read it, but just the summary, the context of it is pretty interesting because for me, at least I have gone through this journey of figuring out when we get sick, when we have issues with our body and muscles and things that lock up, like what is behind that? What's driving that? Um, mm -hmm. And this book seems to speak to that. Would you mind talking more about that? Sure. And actually, I'm going to bring a, a second book into the conversation. My new book, because it pairs well with that. Okay. And so avoiding the cosmic two by four. So people hear that and they're like, what? You know, so the cosmic two by four is, you know, the perpetual whack up the side of the head trying to get your attention. And so the book really delves into who we are on a subtle energy perspective, because when we're in health and when we have good vitality, our subtle energy, our life force energy is moving and flowing inside of us. But we have negative thinking, we have obtrusive emotional responses, and those interfere with the movement of energy through the chakras or through the seraphs, which is the Kabbalistic viewpoint of it, until it will condense so much that it manifests in the physical body as some kind of disease. And so if you're being symptomatic, you know, what, whether it's Usually it's a chronic illness, you know, versus an acute, you know, you catch a cold, you get it, you break your arm, that kind of thing. You have been working on that, that brokenness for a very, very, very long time. And so by the time it gets to the physical body, you know, it's, it, it's the whack up the side of the head saying, hey, you need to pay attention to me. And so in that book, I provide examples to start recognizing the issues that are going on. How's that? But, and wait, I have, a, I have a visual, but this is my brand new book. It's called Dang, It Was Me All Along. And it really goes into looking inside of yourself and what do what do I need to do to change my energy so that I can be better in that flow? I think it's really empowering. I know sometimes people don't like hearing that they're the ones driving a lot of the turmoil and things that manifest within their world. But to me, I find it really empowering because when we f figure out that typically we're the agent driving it, then we know we can fix it. We are in control and can 
be the agent to heal, be the agent to change and be the person that's driving that. And it really pulls us out of that victim box into that empowered, you know, I can do this soldier box. (laughs) Exactly. You know, but for me to get to the place where, you know, I got this spiritual ass kicking for years and years and years to finally go, oh, well, maybe it's me. It's hard. (laughs) You know, that was was kind of a hard nut to swallow. It's like, you know, but you start like Xing everything out. Well, it wasn't them and it wasn't this and it wasn't this and it wasn't this and what's left? Me. (laughs) Thus the title. (laughs) So, so how long does it take somebody, I guess it's, it's case by case, right? But somebody who's been suffering through their own issues and then you know, finding out that it's them, like the next step would be, you know, just dealing with it for, I guess, until you're, you're feel better. I, I'm sure it's probably a gradual process, right? Like it can't just, it's, there's no quick fix for something like that. Right. So I've been working on myself pretty much my whole life. Um, you know, I come from a family of trauma and I've been trying to fix myself because I felt like there was something inherently wrong. And when I started on this journey, you know, and I really share the book as a journey and it's not an autobiography, although I do share some pretty funny stories about like, oops, (laughs) guess I shouldn't have done that. Um, I start and, and really starting this practice of raising my awareness to my thoughts and my emotions, because usually that's the connection. I started noticing significant changes in six months. I have been on this journey for not quite two years. And I have to say I am the happiest I have ever been in my entire life. That's amazing. Yeah. Period. (laughs) I'm like, wait, I like... I mean, you should see my library. Okay, other than like the ancient mystery kind of archaeology books, there's like one whole giant side that's all self-help books. And I finally got to where it's like I'm just getting, well, I don't want to say I'm going to throw them away because I won't, but but they don't fix you. They just reinforce, you know, that there's something wrong with you. For me, I oftentimes feel like the hardest obstacle – for a lot of people is the ability to have introspection and self-awareness. And Mm -hmm. so by creating books like, you know, the cosmic two by four and dang, it was me all along. I think that really helps because it is really hard to be introspective, especially when we're clouded by emotions, like that real present moment that is causing us to feel whatever we're feeling, whether it's physical pain or emotional pain, uh, So having things like that to help you identify that, I think, is a really big first step. Well, you know, and it's not, I mean, there's a certain level of curiosity, but the real focus of this is becoming mindfully aware of what's going on inside. There are so many of us that just run around on autopilot that, you know, stuff happens and our brain goes off and now we're having an emotional response and we might become emotionally reactive or we'll start complaining or we'll, we'll, we'll do our shtick, whatever that is, you know, I suck, everybody hates me, you know, whatever that is. But we're so unaware that we're trapped in this pattern that's like a virus that was introduced to our system. And so the key is to start becoming aware. It's like, oh, you're trapped in some negative thinking. Hmm, What are you thinking? You know, what's the words that keep coming up? Because usually it's two or three words that there's a consistency to, you know, and what can you do about it? So again, this book literally just came out. One of my clients got into, she was like, well, you know, I'm on page 20 and, you know, I'm kind of, reflecting on, you know, what you're talking about. And I finally said to her, I said, look, this is my advice. And I say this in the book, read the whole book because you need to know where the result is going to be and what this whole process is going to be. And then go back and self-reflect because it will make more sense to you having gone through this kind of whole process and know what the goal is. Because I feel like 
if you knew that if I started doing this stuff and paying attention, that my life would change in six months to a year. So I have a girlfriend and we've been kind of supporting. I was already well on this journey, but she, oh my God, she would just freak out. And I know she doesn't care if I talk about it. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, it's something would happen and she would be like, my house is going to fall down. It's going to like burn up, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so, you know, and thankfully, when I, I call it bad brain, you know, because even though I, I feel so much better, you know, I still have my moments where I get into my own negative thinking, you know, so she's really been there for me and I'm there for her. And the changes that I have seen in her in not quite a year, you know, it's supposed to get down to like nine degrees here in Texas this next week. And normally she would be like off the deep end, worrying that her pipes are going to freeze. And then what is she going to do? And blah, blah, blah. And she's just like, I'm just going to drip the water and it's all going to be okay. And I'm like, holy crap, you're going to be okay. <laughs> you know, versus a week of her freaking out and then nothing happens huge change. Yeah. I feel like I know so many people that are like that, that just, I mean, even my own father is like that. He's, <laughs> he's very much, uh, you know, just, just freaks out over, over s little things. And it's like, just, just chill, dad, it's all good. Like, you know, just, and I think uh, a lot of people would, you know, would be helped by things that you're talking about tremendously. Cause I think a lot of people just mm -hmm. don't, they're, they, a lot of people don't change. A lot of people either they they don't want to change, they're afraid to change, and wherever that might lead them. But like, what's the alternative, right? It's just a cycle of garbage that you're <laughs> that you're living through. And obviously, life isn't all garbage. But you know, if you want to improve your quality of life and all the things, you know, it's good to to try new things, to reach out to people who have experienced like real change. And I think that's great. You know, and I feel like it, for me, this process, this journey hasn't been about, I need to change. My personal goal was I wanted to have happiness in my life and I wanted to have inner peace and I was willing to do what I needed to do to have that, you know, so change was never a word, you know, so I would just start paying attention to what was going on inside of me and around me. And it's kind of like, Oh, well, whenever I interact with this person or I have this situation happen, it makes me feel bad, you know, or it puts me into a negative place. And so that would be the cue to go, well, why is that happening? You know, and it would open up a level of curiosity versus I need to change it. Because what I have found with everybody is that if you find yourself in a situation that is annoying, 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 then you're going to ultimately change it because you get tired of being stuck there. If there's awareness, there's a lot of times, you know, people that are in toxic relationships that they just keep going back for more, but there's no awareness of every time I go back, I feel like crap. And every time I interact with this person, I feel like crap. But you start to become aware, it's like, hey, every time I interact with this person, I, I leave feeling like crap. Maybe I shouldn't interact with this person anymore. Well, and like you just said, it's it's not just other people, right? It could be other things, other entities, other kinds of things that are affecting your well-being as well, right? Like that you keep going to. Like, I don't know if people, like, I don't know if people who do these um, these ghost haunts and all these different things, um, if they, if they're being affected negatively and if that's something that, that, I don't know, that you would, like you say, you've, you've run into a lot of weird stuff, right? So I think that obviously it could be other people, but it also could be your job or what you're doing, right? Like the, the place that you live, the, the area, the community, right? There could be a lot of external forces that are, that are affecting, your well-being and yeah maybe it's time to move or or change your relationship or or what you know i mean you see that a lot with people's jobs where they're in a job and they hate it and the job is pretty toxic 
but they won't go, you know, and so they're willing to sacrifice themselves on a daily basis for that paycheck versus saying, you know, this isn't really working for me and I need to come up with a different choice, you know, and, and there's change and then there's choice. And sometimes making a different choice is really hard. And sometimes you're like white knuckling the furniture while you're, you know, making a decision. But most people, when they, they really kind of connect inside and go, you know, I don't want to do this anymore, always feel better. And in retrospect, always validate that the choice that they made was really good and healthy for them. I think that there are different personality types and awareness definitely being aware of your situation or the change or choice that needs to be made isn't always enough because there's other things that factor into that balance. And that can create, I think, almost a paralysis, right? An action paralysis and a a choice paralysis of making a change um, because certain behaviors or certain surroundings benefit like the individual. So like, well, I don't need to change this or I don't need to make that effort because I'm being taken care of because I'm, you know, kind of complacent and passive in my life and that's okay. And, um, but that's also a choice. It is, it is absolutely. I mean, in relationships, you hear of these women that stay in horrid relationships because their partner is the breadwinner or their partner makes a lot of money, you know, and so they don't want to leave because they don't want their lifestyle interrupted with. And that's their choice. They would rather walk around feeling miserable every day than to be free, you know, and you have to just go, okay, you know, that's the choice you're making. I mean, it's not for me to judge that choice, but I don't know. I would rather be happier. <laughs> I, I, I did have a question in regards to uh, dreams. So obviously on this podcast, I've, I've talked a lot about dreams. Ashley has as well. John, we've all talked about how dreams kind of um, affect our lives and all of that. Have you run into any situations where you're talking to a client and a lot of their issues manifest in their dreams? And is that something that you um, identify with or something that you can help them with through that? Like having pain in a dream or having a reoccurring dream, that kind of thing? So I am not personally a dreamer and people kind of hate me. And it used to be a lot better before, but, you know, I can go to hit the pillow and within 20 minutes I'm asleep And then at six or seven o'clock in the morning, I wake up and it's just like dead air. And if I have a dream, it's usually a bad dream and it'll wake me up in the middle of the night. And so I know that I must be dreaming, but I got nothing. And, um, you know, so it really makes it hard to relate to people that are dreamer people because I have, I got, I've got nothing. You know, and if I'm laying on that pillow and it's more than 20 minutes, I have insomnia and there are people that really hate me and I've had earthquakes happen. I've had transformers blow up. And the only reason I woke up is because the person I was with, like grabbed my arm. Now you do, uh, run the Institute of Applied Energetics. So what kind of certification and teaching do you do counsel in? Not dreams. Okay. <laughs> Not dreams. No, there's no dream course. And so the Institute of Applied Energetics is a distance learning. So I don't want to say it's online. I mean, the, you download the courses, but, you know, they're PDF files um, that train people or certify people in being an energy medicine practitioner an intuitive counselor, AKA psychic, um, or a medical intuitive. And so each course is progressive. It starts with a course on um, 
just learning about your own energy, you know, learning how to ground your body, how to interact with your aura, how to heal yourself. And then it takes that base of information and goes, okay, now that you know how to do this, and now that you've experienced the benefit of this, now you're going to take that same technique and apply it to somebody else, you know, and it just keeps growing and progressing through, you know, not the exact same techniques, you know, cause I keep adding other stuff, but well, I mean, cause I get people that go, well, I just want to take the medical intuitive course. And I'm like, well, that includes all of this. And it's not just individual, you know, because it really works with people on how to interact with energy on a clairsentient level. So on a feeling level, as well as on a visual level, on a clairvoyant level. Do you find that your clair gifts have stayed kind of consistent throughout your practice or have they kind of evolved and ebbed and flowed into the different clair abilities as you've gone along? That's a great question. So, I mean, I definitely was a very visual clairvoyant kind of gal. And pretty quickly, and I think it's more because I didn't pay attention to it, um, my clairsentience, my ability to feel energy, and I think it's more because I just really did, wasn't you know, aware of that. I was affected by it, but I wasn't cognitively aware of it or didn't pay attention to it. My Clara audience, the part where like dead people can actually talk to you, um, is still, it is way better than it used to be, um, but not anything that I really want to try to bank on. I, I joke around that they're like the best backseat psychics, you know, because I'll be thinking, oh, well, I should do this. Or I'm like going to tell a client something and I get, don't tell her that, tell her this. And it's like, okay. Or they just say weird stuff to me. You know, I was working with someone who had, I think it was a kidney issue. And I'm going, well, let's see, you know, what would be a good supplement for you? And so, you know, I have my handful that I work with. But they weren't seeming particularly, you know, like they were for her. And I hear hydrangea. Well, I have hydrangeas growing in my backyard. And I'm like, huh? So I always have my computer open. And I'm like, well, let's just see. And I type in like kidney issue hydrangea. Bam. It is a remedy for some kind of a kidney issue. I forget. But it was the one we were talking about. And so they'll tell me weird stuff and I'm like, listen and verify. <laughs> Cause if it's just weird to me, it's like, I don't want to tell somebody something that isn't real. Although they have proven themselves over and over again that they are. So I just love that you've got your own spiritual team of backseat psychics. <laughs> I call them the peanut gallery. <laughs> Are they specific to the person that you're working with, or is it a set team that you have, a set peanut gallery? They're just these guys that are over here. Ah. You know, people are like, well, do you know who they are? And I'm like, no. Well, why Why don't you find out? I'm like, don't need to. <laughs> they're the peanut gallery, you know? And I can tell you that sometimes there's three, sometimes there's four. A lot of the times I can separate out if it's someone's spirit communicating with me versus the peanut gallery. I'm getting better at that. I mean, it definitely is a learned skill, but to, again, you know, say, hey, dead Aunt Sally, do you have a message for me? Eh, not so much. Yeah, and you got to take it with a grain of salt. Like, what do I, what, this th these things that they're telling me, are they are they telling me them to help? <laughs> or why are they telling me them? These these different things, are they, are they as a dead spirit are they still knowledgeable on these things are they talking about what it, are is this a doctor from like the 1700s the <laughs> it's like oh you just need a you just need a hammer for that like that's all you got to do like what what kind of things are you hearing from these these entities so one of the i have two very early stories that i'll try to have be very quick so i used to run a psychic fair in washington state and I had just started my naturopath degree and this woman was asking about something and I'm about to say something and I get this 
no, don't tell her that. And I literally stopped and looked up and I'm like, what? And now I'm feeling really stupid because now I'm like talking to the air. And, um, and so then they like gave me this piece of information, which was actually better than what I would. And she like totally validated it. And, and then another early one. So I was driving to a meeting in downtown Dallas and it was on a Saturday. So there wasn't a lot of traffic. And so I was perhaps, although I will never admit this out loud, going just a bit above the speed limit. So I had gotten a flat tire on my car. So I had the spare on and the spare had like all these little weights all on it because I had dented the rim and, and for months, I would get this little, you need to change the tire. And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. See, this is how they talk, but this is how spirit talks. It's like, you need to change the tire. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I didn't listen. Well, now I'm not speeding down that freeway. And I get this loud voice that says, you need to change the tire. And I like slow down to the speed limit. <laughs> Air and back and got my tire, tire changed because I was like, wow, that was uh, pretty <laughs> impressive. Sounds like you, ha you have spirits out for your well-being, though, at least, right? Or trying to help you. So that's great. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, they're not asking. I mean, obviously, they're not getting paid to help you out. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's good. That you know I, of. <laughs> maybe, maybe, yeah. Well, you know, but I think for them, partially, you know, partial payment is that you pay attention to them. Right. I love that you had the one that's kind of quietly like, hey, change it. And finally, it's like, she's not listening. So the loud one came through, change the tire. <laughs> well, normally, you know, prior to that, because I had tried to start paying attention to that voice. I would not listen, not listen, not listen. And I'd get the two by four. You know, so like big time, like, oh, just crash the car. Oh, OK. Uh, you know, so I, I feel blessed that they just gave me the loud voice and not the crash the car because you have a flat tire, not really driving over the speed limit, <laughs> which would have been bad because I was really not going over the speed limit a lot. So it sounds like you're, you know, you're getting these messages kind of throughout randomly throughout time. Does that mean that you are consistently open? Well, I think everybody gets messages consistently through time and we either pay attention to them or we don't, you know, and I feel like your life goes better. You don't get those wax up the side, you know, get having a physical disease is just one manifestation of the whack. You know, there are all kinds of negative things that happen to us. And when we stop and think about it, it's like, well, you know, I was thinking about that. I should have listened to myself, you know? So if you just take the position of, well, I should just listen to myself, then I won't get the whack, you know, that two by four, then it just makes it be better. Do you find consistently working with people's energy fields and uh, all of the effort you put into the medical intuitive practice in the Institute, do you ever find that to be draining on your own personal energy or have you found a way to just kind of balance that? I find working with clients, I find doing interviews, I find doing my live stream make my energy flow. So I can go into a session or an interview or whatever and be like, <laughs> and cranky <laughs> as hell. <laughs> and by the time I'm done, I'm like, Woo! you know, and feel really good, you know, and especially doing a session, you know, one of the things that they talk about when you want to get into the flow is about like doing meditation. Well, when you're doing a session, it really makes you focus your attention on, something, you know, and so even though it's not traditional meditation, it still is a meditative practice. And so it gives me the opportunity to heal and feel better by the time I'm done. That's so interesting. I've never heard it put that way, but that's, I could see that completely, how that could be meditative. Mm -hmm. I talk about all that stuff in the book. 
I got to read the book. (laughs) So I know we're reaching that hour limit. Do we have any final thoughts or questions before we wrap it up? This went by so quickly. I do have one question. Um, If you were to give any advice to people, obviously to read your book, but as well as just that, where to start, where to start um, going down this path and um, for their own well-being, if they're dealing, if they've been dealing with something for quite a while and they know that it's, that it's them, um, is there, is there something that they can do um, in those initial steps? You know, and they don't even have to admit that it's them. You know, my my first step guidance is to start paying attention to what's going on inside. Is my energy good? And do I feel uplifted? Or do I feel down and less than and with lower worth? You know, because when you feel good and you are in joy and when you're in, you know, a, a moment of gratitude... You don't have negative thinking. But when you go to the other end of the spectrum, and you don't have to go that far down the other end of the spectrum, you're already moving into negative thoughts. And the goal, at least my goal in this book, is how to stay in that higher vibration because you don't feel bad, you know, and you, it's not even that you accept things, but you, I don't, it's hard to explain. You know, but that's the first step is to just really start paying attention. Where is your internal barometer? Are you in a place of joy or are you in the rabbit hole? Because if you're in the rabbit hole all the time, then mm, maybe you want to do things just a little bit differently. Great. Thanks. Now, where can people find more information about you and the Institute and your books? Sure. They can go to my website, which is soulhealer.com, S-O-U-L-H-E-A-L-E-R.com, soulhealer.com. So, I mean, you can buy the books off my website. You can get information about the Institute. There's actually a free download, Jumpstart Your Intuition, that you can get from that webpage. Um, All my books are available on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, you know, like all of that good stuff. And I'd like to share on Thursday nights on either Facebook or YouTube, just energy radio on YouTube, I do a live stream. And so I do kind of like an introductory talk, like this week's topic is going to be neglecting yourself. And then I open it up. People can type questions, except not about dead people or the future, into the chat box. And I do on-air readings. Or we just goof around or whatever. So it's fun. Thursday night, 7 p.m. Central. All right. Thank you so much for coming on, Dr. Rita Louise. You've been amazing. I've enjoyed this conversation. I feel like I could have gone much longer, but, you know, we have to respect Mm -hmm. the time. (laughs) Well, I appreciate you guys having me on, and we'll have to do it again sometime. Oh, absolutely. We would love that. All right, John Thomas. You want to bring us home? Oh, yeah. Thank you again, Dr. Rita Louise. It's been a blast. I love hearing your stories and everything else. And I'm going to pick up your books because I need to read those for sure. So, yes. Uh, And thank you to everybody for listening to this episode of 300 Podcast with your host. I'm John Thomas. I am Ashley Lunar Goddess. And I'm BJ Seura. And if you have any questions, comments, or episode suggestions, please feel free to email us at 300 podcast at gmail.com. And if you haven't done so already, please like, follow, and subscribe to all of our social media. You don't want to miss amazing guests like Dr. Rita Louise. Also, be sure to visit our website, 3hauntedpodcast.com, for more information on our guests as well as merch. Until next time. <laughs>